You're watching viewer-supported public television, WLIW Channel 21. Do you recognize these characters? Uh, that's not very merry, fellas. Well, let's yuck it up a bit, eh? Exit! Stage left! Thanks for the basket. Uh, don't worry, I will turn you in. It's sing-along time. Hey, quick, Straw. Don't you think I can come out now? Uh-oh. I don't think so. Oh, got it! Oh, got it! Hello, young waffle lovers, wherever you are. Professor Goody here, high up in this bell tower. These characters' voices and dozens of others loved worldwide are all the work of one talented gentleman whose career spans 50 years and encompasses virtually every area of show business. His name, Dawes Butler, voice magician. Well, the way the whole thing started, I think I was uh, kind of a shy kid, which I don't think will be too apparent after this interview. Charles Dawson Butler, a shy kid from Chicago, got his show business start in school by being a playground comic, imitating his teachers and generally trying to deal with his shyness. Eventually, in the 1930s, he teamed up with two friends to become the Three Short Waves. The trio toured the Midwest, working the nightclubs and theaters. Although Dawes loved to write, he had been reluctant to perform. He didn't know how good he was. And, uh, and we worked together, and I learned an awful lot about show business, especially from the wiser heads who would advise me, tell me what I was doing wrong, why I didn't get a laugh. And I began to see what timing was, and while the other two guys were chasing the girls, I would go and stand in the wings and watch comics who were on the bill every show to see how no matter how big the audience was, they'd always get their laugh. It was like fishing, they'd come home with something, you know? And uh, so that was very good. And I also found a great kindness in them. They were willing to advise and, and to answer questions if I asked them. Doing impersonations of Groucho Marx, Joey Brown, and Edward G. Robinson gave Dawes great pleasure. One of his favorites was his idol, George Arliss. Uh, Arliss was great. I mean, people, the kids today don't even know who he is, but once in a while on late TV, you'll see him. But he had a sort of an angular face. Mine was round. And so by putting my tongue in my lower lip, I could look like him. And by hooding my eyes a little bit, gave the look. By slumping my shoulders a little, by getting a, a, a laxity in my hands that made them old. And, uh, and I did a scene so that... Uh, and it also gave me the voice. That was the fantastic part. Because to do it, I would have to go, come close to me, my sons, and listen to the words of your father. One son must go to Germany, one to France, and the other to England. Remember, in unity, there is strength. We are the house of Rothschild. Dawes discovered that if you could look and sound like the character you were doing, you could be the character. And that's where I really got onto the idea of retaining all of that and doing it with voiceover. Nothing changed, except you were only hearing my voice. So I was really, it was like going to Harvard. I mean, that was it. Those few years in the nightclubs and the theaters gave me the stability and the, the knowledge uh, to go ahead and to take it in any direction I wanted to. So it happened to be voiceover, and that's where I spent the rest of my career. Dawes spent World War II in the Navy in Washington, where he met his beautiful wife, Mertes. The lady Dawes calls his staunchest supporter and most devoted friend. And then we came out here after the war, and I stumbled into radio. I'd never done radio back in Chicago or any of the Middle West or the South, but I had worked on microphones. I was even working on mic technique uh, when I was on a, on a nightclub floor or, or a theater because um, it was a different type of mic. They aren't as sharp as they are today, but I realized that if I was doing a voice that was very, a little huskier than mine, I could get very close to it and it would give me a better sound and so on. So I was learning that too, but almost without knowing it. It was just that somehow I had, a, I had to address that huge audience, that big theater, and get the tonality I wanted. 
uh, all of my theories about if you could look like him, you could sound like him, carried over into character work. And that ability to do characters got Dawes many radio shows. Anyway, after doing radio for quite a while, playing on some very big shows, The Whistler, Suspense, you know, uh, in a year or two, I mean, it was, it was fantastic. Actually, a year. And uh, suddenly I was doing these big shows. And uh, then after that was established and I was had a little money coming home, why uh, somebody said, why don't you go out to MGM? There's a guy out there named Tex Avery, great director. Tex Avery was one of the several now legendary animation directors at Warner Brothers and MGM in the 1930s and 40s. His cartoons were timed out using a metronome. This appreciation of comic timing greatly appealed to Dawes. And I worked with Tex for probably, oh, I don't know, three or four years at least, and did maybe 15 or 20 cartoons for him. Learned a lot. And also an interesting thing about comedy, and that is you laugh at the timing there are many things of Texas that I was in, things I wasn't in, but Texas cartoons, and I know the gag. I know what it is. I see it coming. But the minute it comes, I laugh, because I laugh at the timing. Everything worked. It had a reason, a point. And, uh, and Stan worked out there, too, on some things. Stan Freeberg. Uh, how many Stans do I know? Well, that's an important one. The personal and professional relationship between Stan Freeberg and Dawes is the stuff of legends. Television and records haven't been the same since they met. It all began in 1949. The first time I ever met this guy um, was when a man named Bob Clampett, who was a former uh, Warner Brothers cartoon director, and uh, Dawes and I had both worked for you'd worked for him, right? Oh, sure, yeah. Well, no, not really. Just I was just uh, keeping him company in his living room with his mother. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I had actually worked, worked for him as a, as a voice, voiceover uh, man on a few cartoons, but, uh, and he said that he had this rough idea for a television show. Now it's time for Beanie. And there were a few characters. There was a captain, Uncle Captain Huff and Puff and Beanie, and uh, the, the concept of a ship called the Leaking Alina came along. And uh, so we were kicking it around one time, and uh, uh, we needed a heavy, some kind of a menace for the first show. We had a character, we thought, let's have a sea serpent. And then I had the idea of saying, let's have a seasick sea serpent. You got alliteration, and it's kind of a dumb idea to think of a sea serpent being seasick. And I said, you know, like Sam, the seasick sea serpent. And the writer said, no, I think Cecil, it's got a little more class. We had one show written, and Cecil was supposedly the menace. There was a storm and a bit and so forth. But he was so funny, and Beanie took to him so quickly, it was like a boy finding a dog. And there, it was a great love affair between the two. China. Hi, Cece. Hi, boy. Howdy. Hey, when are we heading for China, boy? I'm all ready to go. Well, I don't know, Cece, but Uncle Captain just went to find out right now. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hot diggity dog. I'll be glad to get out of this place before I start turning Hollywood, you know. Yeah, well, listen, Cece. I want to go Hollywood. The original Cecil puppet was created by Mertis Butler using the most basic pajama materials available. Uh, it was a, um, uh, it just happened to be the right kind of terry cloth. It was either a pajama sleeve or a pajama leg, I forget which, but it happened to be green. I really made it under protest because I've never made anything like that. But at the time, our sons, the older two, were wearing Dr. Denton pajamas and they had the feet in them. So we, we used that as sort of the pattern to... That was uh, Cecil's mouth. Right. Yeah. That was Cecil's mouth, right. Yeah. And uh, happened to have purple felt that made the fins and the uh, uh, eyelashes were copied from a, a stuffed animal that one of the boys had that had eyelashes like that made out yeah. of felt, just, you know, kind of fringed. And a green tongue. And a green... Oh, no, it was a blue, uh, red, red tongue. Red tongue. Yeah. And the uh, nostrils were um, suction cups. Suction cups that used for a, a line across the bathroom, you know, for laundry. Socks or whatever. And the, I think I don't know where we got the buttons for the eyes. I think we went but, to one um, of the. It was to be a puppet to be used until they find something better. A but when puppet. Stan got a hold of yeah. it, and it he magic. made it, you know, so pliable, yeah. and gave it life. Why? And they she made a more it. elaborate one, you know, that had flaring eyes and this and that was frightening in effect uh, but nobody liked it 
He said, go back to the other guy, the funny guy. Uh, so one night, um, I went through the wall, brick wall, to save Beanie. And he said, Beanie boy, Beanie boy, right? Okay, <laughs> anyhow. Do it, do it, he, uh, do it. Oh, Beanie boy, Beanie boy, Beanie boy. Oh, I've saved you, right? Okay. Oh, jeez, you are my hero. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then uh, you noticed that my nostril was missing. That's right. And uh, what was the line? Uh, you said, I, I said uh, something about, and you were bringing out the treasure in your mouth. With the yeah, I said, gained the treasure. We gained the treasure and lost the nostril. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Did you, so tell me the story about the about the um, the fat bat. Oh, that was funny. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that was a funny one. Yeah. Uh, they we, they had this uh, character called Fat Bat who guarded the entrance to Close Shave Cave, and so uh, I think um, either we were trying to get out, Beanie and Cecil were trying to get out, or we were trying to get into the cave. And uh, anyhow, this the, the bat was created by a balloon that was blown up, you see, <laughs> yeah. and little cardboard wings glued on the side of this yeah, fat bat. And little eyes were put and, on and, it. Yeah. yeah, and little eyes, right. So um, we were supposed to give this bat uh, some diet pills, you know, and yeah. take this diet pill or re eat some of this rye crisp or whatever and get thin fast. Yeah. And then we were supposed to let the air out of the balloon so the, originally the bat went like this. I'm a big fat bat and I'm so big and fat that I'm stuck right in this uh, door and you can't get out no more. One of those <laughs> yeah. wonderful poems. Okay, yeah. anyhow, so then he eats the thing and he's supposed to go and then we would cut to this very small bat <laughs> ma made out of, uh, you know, balsa or whatever we say. Yeah. Okay, you can go in now. <laughs> right. Yeah. But anyhow, the, the bats air would not come out because the lights were so hot in the early days of television right. that the balloon has has um, has uh, adhered to itself, you know. Yeah. The rubber is actually melted. Yeah. And Ralph Loretz, this wonderful guy that dropped yeah. the cards, is down below. And over the earphones from the booth, let the air out of the bat. Okay, let the air out of the bat now. <laughs> okay. Now, it's a tight close-up. And on the screen is this bat going... Am right? All of a sudden, the bat goes... Blam! A million pieces of bat skin, and a piece of bat skin fell right over Beanie's head, and another one under Uncle Captain's pith helmet. <laughs> Some, oh yeah, the, and uh, one of us said the line. Oh, there uh, goes a good kid. Yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> there goes a good kid. Became a popular phrase nationwide, and Time for Beanie was a tremendous success in early television winning several Emmys during its run and managing in its appeal to cross all age barriers. I was always a little jealous of Stan because he had a sea serpent that he could do and it had a mouth, you know, that you could put your hand into and funny little eyes, you know, uh, made out of buttons and whatever and you could move his hand around and, and, and you know, and, and he sang songs and so forth. And Beanie had this little mouth that I could hardly get my finger into, made out of hard rubber. It was a department store doll head to begin with, and, and it was fixed up. And we just built a, a dress for him, a little suit for him, and so so. But he didn't have much, much there, see. So Cecil was always saving him. He'd be in big trouble. And one time he was in the fairly quicksand, and Cecil was looking all over for him. And so you can imagine, this is the set, this is the quicksand, and he's going, Help, Cecil, help! 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 <laughs> he goes under these things. So I, then I go up, and, I, and he goes, and he pulls him out, you know, he says, Beanie, I can hardly hear you, you weren't talking very loud. I got thin lips. I got a perpetual smile. <laughs> I mean, I was just in a bad mood or something that day. <laughs> but anyway, it was kind of a funny bit. I think it was a surprise to everybody that it was such a sensation. Uh, people talked about it at, at dinner parties. Uh, Lionel Barrymore uh, had to see it every night. And if he was shooting at the studio, he would have his chauffeur go across the street and see it at the local pub so that he could find out what was going on. People wouldn't go on their vacation because of the show. And uh, it was just a wonderful uh, creative thing for all of them, I think, and, and uh, a way that both Stan and Daz were launched into, into uh, a more a bigger things, I guess you'd say. It was quite a show. I'm sorry I never got to see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the great things about uh, uh, Dawes and my association was that uh, we not only worked together on uh, Time for Beanie, of course, every day for five years, but concurrently somewhere in there, 
uh, we started to work together on records. I had already started making records about 1950 with John and Marcia and uh, the Yellow Rose of Texas and the uh, uh, C.C. Bone, Take Off on Earth a Kit and other things. And then um, Dawes and I uh, collaborated on uh, what was my biggest record, uh, St. George and the Dragon. Uh, Dawes and I wrote that. So we wrote two sides and uh, went in and recorded it and got the, got the permission from uh, Jack Webb. And he was all for it. He thought it was great, you know. And uh, and they weren't terribly satiric. I mean, they didn't make him look bad. They just, it was a different switch on him. And Stan did him, and I did the other characters, and June did the female characters. That was the first time that I had used a voice like this. You know, I was the maiden almost devoured by fire. He bind me already. Um, they wanted something different. And I had been doing all kinds of voices in radio and on records, but I had never... Uh, I had never done a voice like that. And they said, come up with something different. And so I came up with it. So we did a record called St. George and the Dragonette, which was St. George going after the dragon, Dragonette, very clever. Can I talk to you, ma'am? Who are you? I'm St. George, ma'am, homicide, ma'am. I want to ask you a few questions, ma'am. I understand you're almost devoured by the ma'am. Is that right, dragon? It was terrible. He breathed fire on me. He burned me already. Would you describe him for me? What's to describe? You see one dragon, you've seen them all. Would you try and remember, sir, just for the record? We just want to get the facts, sir. Well, he was, you know, he had orange polka dots. Yes, sir. Purple feet, breathing fire and smoke. Mm -hmm. And one big bloodshot eye right in the middle of his forehead and uh, like that. So Little Blue Riding Hood and St. George and the Dragon, it was the first comedy record to sell over a million copies. And Stan and I went to New York around Ed Sullivan's show and whatever. And then we did about five or more albums, too. Uh, Person to Pearson, which was a takeoff on Edward R. Murrow. And uh, I did a character uh, who had a clock rat. He was an old guy who lived behind the P A and P. That's because they kicked him out from behind the Piggly Wiggly, you know. And he had a clock rat that bit him awake every morning so he could get up and not get caught by the man P guys. And it was a crazy, wonderful, almost uh, Fred Allen-ish type of writing, very off the wall and a lot of non sequitur and delicious. And that's the kind of stuff Stan and I like to write. The dying gasp of situation sketch comedy on national radio was Butler and Freeberg's next stop. Writers in Hollywood knew a great showcase when they heard it. Every writer in town was turning in stories and so on. Perfect cast, June Foray, Peter Leeds, uh, Judd Conlon's singers. You remember the sketch uh, on, the, on our radio show where this guy was a werewolf Oh, yeah. And uh, his uh, <laughs> secretary, he discovered, was also a werewolf, and he only discovered that when there was an eclipse of the sun in the middle of the day. And uh, <laughs> he, he uh, looked at her and, and he said, You mean you too, Lucretia? And she went, Yes. And he says, I thought your nylons were getting a little furry there. And then Dawes Butler came into the room. It was the only guy I ever heard to get an absolute scream of laughter with no funny joke in sight. Yeah, yeah, and, I, he yeah and I said, take. I said, gee, oh, hi, fellas. Yeah, yeah. oh, hi, fellas. Gee, you look great in those suits. And then she did another one. I yeah. said, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a great reaction. Yeah. And the audience screamed and applauded just yeah. at the way you read the line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Butler Freeberg teaming was a stroke of good fortune for audiences and performers alike. Stan is particularly grateful. Before I met Dawes Butler, I think I was just uh, what you could call a voice man. You know, that's a guy that does voices, okay. But I don't believe I was really an actor until I met Dawes Butler. And uh, he, on that show, as we went on working together over the years, he taught me a lot about, about acting. And uh, he, I never really thought about how the acting has to start in here and, and, and in here. Uh, and then last of all, it comes out as a voice. I don't think I ever read with anybody that I enjoyed reading with as much as Stan and probably Don Messick. Uh, it's like one mind just switching back and forth, just turn a button and wah, 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 like a computer. And we could read each other and it was marvelous. And uh, I always refer to it as a short but happy marriage. You know, we worked together about eight years or so. And then we went our separate ways, but we had learned an awful lot. We were our own university, you might say. In 1954, Dawes tried his talented hand at yet another type of entertainment, 
the television commercial. Well, Beanie ran for five years, and it was quite an experience, as you can assume. And then I was kind of uh, high and dry because everybody thought of me, of me as a puppeteer, and Stan too. And we never really considered ourselves puppeteers. We were doing animated cartoons with things on our hands, you know. And I'm doing it now, where no chance for redos and whatever. So uh, I stumbled on to a few people in animation who were looking for comedy writing or funny writing. And as I say, writing was a great love. So I got into one house, and they were doing some doing some uh, commercials and they asked me to try my hand at it and I went home and wrote it that night where they usually would expect it in a week, you know. Came back with about five different directions on a 30 second spot and a 20 second spot and whatever. And they were accepted by the agency and I did the voices for it or else I cast June Foray or somebody uh, that would be good for it. And the first thing I know I spent about a year or more just writing and doing commercials, doing the voices. Have you heard about the new Thunderbird styling? Have you heard about the new Thunderbird Y8 engine? Have you heard about that new lifeguard design? Are you mean uh, in the 1956 Ford? Let's go down to our Ford dealers and see it. It's a deal! And amigos, you'll love instant MJB too. Flash dried for perfect flavor. New label too. Pardon me, sir. Just a moment of your time. Get your foot off of my foot. I gotta get to work. Sir, I'm conducting a survey on thirst. But I gotta get to work. Now, sir, just imagine you're walking through the desert. Uh, come, sir, you're not imagining. Imagine, please. All right, I'm imagining. It's hot. Your throat is parched and you're... Uh, thirsty. Right. You open your knapsack and what's in it? Potato chips. Ah, nuts. You know, it sounds like maybe your distributor points are dirty. But let me take a look, huh? Give her a try now. Great. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, nothing to it, really. It's funny. I never thought a cow would know so much about trucks. Well, you're no more surprised than I am. I never thought a man would know so much about milk. No. 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 You're supposed to be a cow? No. Okay, cow. What does milk taste like? Milk tastes like chocolate. Moo. Mm. Milk shakes taste like chocolate. Moo. Mm. Ice cream tastes like chocolate. Moo. Mm. Chocolate. Moo. Mm. Milk. Moo. Mm. Chocolate. Moo. Mm. Milk. Moo. Mm. Chocolate. Chocolate? Well, well, what does chocolate taste like? Chocolate tastes like Bosco. Just like Bosco. Just like Bosco. Chocolate tastes like Bosco. And because chocolate tastes like Bosco, tastes like you like Bosco. Oh. And so that was, that was quite an experience. And I got to do some, some good things, I think. It got it out of my system. I think it reached the point where, at that time, the agencies kind of respected us for the knowledge that we had accumulated. And we had sort of a free hand. It was fun. We could get the gag and go with it and not have to do too much hard sell. There's a lot of hard sell now. Yes, who? <laughs> Walter Lance, the creator of Woody Woodpecker, teamed up with Dawes in the early 1950s, and Dawes became the voice of Chilly Willie. Dawes was really how to tell that you could use him for anything. If you needed a voice, Dawes could do it. And uh, in those days, you used him for many different voices in the Woody Woodpecker cartoons. I was doing all this supporting characters for Woody. I was doing the heavies, the announcer, the narrator, whatever. I do five or six characters in, in one cartoon all around Woody. You see, and Gracie was wonderful to work with, and we had a great rapport and uh, very supportive, and Walter liked to direct the shows, and uh, he was like Jay Ward or, uh, or Joe Barbera. They really loved it. They'd make us do it over just to hear it again. You know, we were like their toys. The Chilly Willie cartoons were really the the best character I think that Dawes did for me. In fact, uh, uh, Chilly Will didn't speak in about the first oh, eight or ten cartoons. And I thought, well, it might be a good idea if we get the right kind of voice for Chilly and give him a little more character. So I asked Dawes, would he take a shot at it? So Dawes tried it, and I liked it very much. It was one of the highest voices I think I ever did for a character. And uh, it enhanced it somewhat, but even mute. Chilly Willie, to me, was a great character, and he was always playing tricks on, uh, on the dog. He, he usually was pretty succinct. He would say, I'm very cold. I'm cold. I want to go inside. I want to be warm. Oh, gosh, the snow is coming down. See, so he had to articulate and all that. But a very high voice, he very quick, 
And that's why he moved. It was very, 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 very much. That's the way you get a voice by the action. And I'd seen it for years, so it wasn't too hard to put a voice to it. Uh -huh. Dawes did the voices for both characters here. Nice. Nice. You like? I like. More butter? More butter. More syrup? More syrup. Nice. Very nice. Plenty butter. Plenty butter. Plenty syrup. Plenty syrup. Good. Very good. You like? I like. Okay. Okay. More butter? Thank you. You're welcome. Dawes is such a, a good actor. He, in fact, he's an actor. It takes an actor to really do a good voice. Voice artists are not someone that just throw in, in a voice. You, you got to play that character, like my wife Gracie, who does Woody Woodpecker. She made an actor out of Woody, and that's why he caught on so well, you know. I did some of the most interesting characters I've ever done in, uh, in the Walter Lance cartoons. And in many cases, they were only in one cartoon. But it was that the writing called for a certain type of character, and I would do it. And as I say, that's the way you get characters. Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera had used his voiceover skills when they did their award-winning Tom and Jerry cartoons at MGM. In 1957, they reunited. I went into, with Hanna Barbera, when they left MGM, or when M MGM left them, they had to start their own company. And so they took me and Don Messick with them as the show. And we did it for five years, just the two of us. And I knew Don Messick. I'd had known him for quite a while before. And I'd used him in a lot of commercials that I wrote. It's due to Dawes that I got my first cartoon job. And that's before cartoons for television. It was back in the, I guess, early 50s. And MGM was, uh, Tex Avery was looking for uh, a voice. For some reason, Bill Thompson was not available. Uh, he had been doing the droopy character. He was a sad-faced dog. And uh, Dawes knew that I did a similar thing to that. Because I'd done an imitation of, of uh, Wallace Beeple. That was the character that Bill Thompson did for a commercial. Dawes really started into coming into his own uh, when we started Rough and Ready. Yeah. And the oh. cartoons that we created from then on, all of them, Practically every voice we used then was Dawes Butler. Well, actually, Rough and Ready was Don Messick and Dawes Butler. I was the voice of Rough and Professor Gizmo. There's that voice again. And the narrator. Oh, this time I got to do some narration. And, and Dawes was ready, the dog, with a southern accent, a southern dialect. Later, he grew up and became Huckleberry Hound. <laughs> Today. Well, that's not the moon, you goon. That, that's the Earth. Golly, it's a small world, ain't it? Messick and Butler's teamwork truly caught the national TV audience's attention with the appearance of the Huckleberry Hound Show. Although reminiscent of a voice on Rough and Ready, Huck's origins go further back. So anyway, a Huckleberry Hound is more laconic and laid back, and I got the idea for him uh, down in North Carolina, where my wife was from, Albemarle, North Carolina. And when I was in the Navy, I'd come home on a weekend with my little ditty bag to see her and a hitchhike, you know. And so this father would be sitting on the front porch next door. He was a veterinarian, worked for her daddy, with her daddy as a veterinarian, too. And he'd see me come in, you know, panting just to see murders. And he'd say, hi, dogs, come on in and set yourself down. What's going on? Probably hadn't seen me for three weeks, you know, or a month. I said, oh, you know, about the same, and go for the thing. He said, come on up, sit down, we'll talk a little bit. I said, well, uh, maybe a half an hour or so, an hour. <laughs> Anytime, come on back, I want to talk to you. <laughs> so, anyway, he kind of stuck in my head, and I was in the Navy then, but I put him in a little separate box. I didn't even realize I was doing it. And then when Huckleberry Hound came up, there he was. You know. <laughs> Yahoo! That there signal means there's a message. Coming in by arrow. Hmm. I wonder when we're going to get us a postman. Dear Robin, your deed and inheritance are hidden behind the door, behind the coat of arms, in the hall, in the callice, uh, castle. Another soon-to-be-famous character made his debut that same season the irrepressible Yogi Bear. So then, Yogi Bear, yeah, and there's a lot of things about these characters that have a lot to do with the physical. You notice I use my hands all the time. 
and I used his shoulders. And to get a bigger voice, because Yogi's about an eight foot bear and I'm five foot two, I would put my shoulders back, which would give me a bigger sounding board on my chest. Hey, this is Yogi Bear, it's a bigger voice, you see? So it's a combination of the aesthetic and the, and the hardware going together. The voice of Yogi's devoted sidekick, Boo Boo, was provided by Don Messick. You know, uh, Boo Boo first started with kind of a, a voice like that, a, a cold in the nose, but uh, I thought that would be kind of uh, tiresome over the long haul. And <laughs> catchy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Contagious. So uh, I sort of took that quality out of his uh, nasal passages and cleared him up a little bit. Well, it's I, much warmer, I yeah, think. I think exactly. so too. Yeah. Hey, Boo Boo, wake up! What is it, Yogi? A nice little old tourist type lady just left us a picnic basket. But it's against the law to feed us bears, Yogi. That's true, Boo. But it's against my principles to snitch on one of our senior citizens. She may be uh, somebody's mother's mother, and this is her first offense. And besides, besides what, Yogi? Besides, I'm hungry. <laughs> Yay! Uh, well, golly, uh, uh, Yogi. Uh... How come we both got away from Jellystone Park at the same time? Yeah, I don't know, but uh, you found that little road map, and uh, we hit the road, and here we are. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Beverly Hills. Yeah, but, but I don't see any picnic baskets. Hey, uh, we went the wrong way. Must have been a detour. No picnic baskets? If I catch that yogi stealing any picnic baskets, it's back to Jellystone Park with him. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ranger. Uh, I, I was just talking out loud, you know what I mean? Yeah, he does that sometimes, you know, <laughs> so, even in his sleep. <laughs> you hungry, Yogi? I'm always hungry. You know that, Boo-Boo. I think it's past our lunchtime. Uh, why didn't you become a short order cook instead of a buddy? Well, uh, I'm short, <laughs> but uh, I don't know how to order. <laughs> I don't know how to cook. I can order. You can make. That'll work out neat. <laughs> Another thing we both had, I think what Joe and Bill liked was our energy. Mm -hmm. We do things with energy. It can be a, a, a downplayed energy, but it's always there. And nothing is passive. And, and we phrase. We don't read lines like that. Yeah. ins and outs. And we do a lot of really technical things. As you said, it's like acting. Yeah. But we do it bravura, you know, a little mm -hmm. broader for, uh, for cartoons. Uh, and we read each other. Uh, you know, like the type of thing if Don and I were doing a show in the old days, and one of the characters like... Uh, well, for instance, if I did something very slow and grandiose for, for Yogi, he might come in very quickly for, for Boo Boo. Yeah. And then if I did the other thing, he'd say, well, I want to talk to the ranger, blah, 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 blah. And then very slowly well, you would Yogi, say... Yogi, better not do that. <laughs> so the timing, the we pacing, always had the contrast. Feel. But we could feel it between the ourselves. Play. Yeah. Quick Draw McGraw and Baba Louie also rode into TV at that time. And this was an easy one because here's a horse, he got a big head, and you try to do the same thing with the jaw. So it's a jaw character, always based on that. How do I am, quick draw McGraw, the world's fastest gun. And don't you forget it. And I am Baba Louie, his sidekicks. Quickstruck would be nothing without me. What'd you say? He said, you're the greatest. <laughs> and whatever, but, but, and there's no difficulty in going back and forth on the voices because they're not voices, they're characters. And when I think of Baba Louie, my whole body can, can become, hey, Quickstraw, don't you think? And he's like this. He doesn't want to get in trouble, but he wants to make his point, you know? And when Quickstraw, he's a big blustery guy, and that helps to get it out of the chest, you see? So it's like a chest tone. Drop that safe! You crooked, dishonest thief of an outlaw, you! Never, you honest, upright, courageous, sneakerton man, you! And they're all based, all the kid voices, the little voices are all based on the same thing. I mean, Elroy yeah, right, Jetson is, is like that. He's, he's like Baba Louie, but he's not Mexican, you know? And, uh, and then you take uh, uh, Augie Doggy, he has a little tremolo in his voice. He, oh, my dear old father of the year, I want you to be my pal as well as my dad. You know, so that's his little gimmick, but it's the same basic voice. And then uh, Blabbermouth, who's Super Snoopers assistant, is still here. You know, so we get Tookie voice. And that's the way it goes, right down the pike. And uh, some voices are more laconic, like Super Snooper was, uh, oh, Super Snooper, the greatest, the world's greatest uh, detective, and one of this year's modesty award. 
Uh, my name is Mr. Jenks, you know, and uh, I like to clobber those meese, and I got a broom, and that's what I do, I clobber them. And uh, it did not come easily. I went to the university and matriculated and learned how to be a first-rate meese clobberer. But uh, I don't really hurt them too much, you know. I just kind of scared the wits out of them. Because <laughs> I hate measles to pieces. Uh, in, a, in a nice way, you know. Today is Jinxie's birthday. Hooray, hooray, hooray. Today is Jinxie's birthday. Hold it, hold it, Pixie. What's the matter, Dixie? You're singing all the key. Oh, gee, I'm sorry. Okay, let's try it again. Today is Jinxie's birthday. Hooray, hooray. You would think a chap could, uh, you know, get some sleep on his birthday morning. I have to give those loudmouth mises the scoop on who's boss around here. Wally Gator? Wally Gator, the silly alligator that loved his ever loving Everglade. He just had the ball trying to get out and fool around, you know? So be silly, and you get a silly feeling when you do it. And it's roughly based on an Edwin type thing, but Edwin was very high, and this has more of a bass in it, you know, a, a chest tone. And you can, so you have a subtone, actually, like a clarinet or whatever. So you're mixing all these things. Uh, Captain Crunch, which wasn't for Hanna-Barbera, but I've done that for about, oh, I don't know, 15 years or more, uh, and I'm still doing them, it was an interesting thing because I'm always talking about articulation and whatever, and yet with that, I had to minimize all of the action, which comes with the lips and the resonating chambers and the upper chest. So uh, when Captain Crunch talks, it's like this. And there's a lot of illusions. The word just sort of disappears, you know? Like, uh, well, that's the way I am. I could say more, but I'm not supposed to, and they're glaring at me. Don't glare at me. I'm very fragile. I am fragile, you know? Why can't you just bark like other dogs? I wonder if other captains have these problems. But then, they don't have a cereal named after them. <laughs> Another character that I like, too, is Hokey Wolf, fast talker, you know, operator. I Hokey Wolf, I'll take it myself if you don't mind. I mean, if you want to do it, do it. But I'd rather you didn't, because that's the contract we made before the show, and I slipped you a few dollars, and you said you wouldn't. You guaranteed it. We signed the paper. I can take you to court. I can sue you. I can ruin you. But just do what you're supposed to do. You'll be a sweetheart. Ooh, you're a cutie. And Snagglepuss. There's a lot of diaphragm in it. I mean, you gotta stretch things out. You gotta talk in short phrases and sort of milk it, you know what I mean? To make it work. You don't scare me, Rocky. And I ain't going for no ride. Besides, it looks like rain. Snow, even. This colorful feline seems to be high on many people's lists of favorite Dawes Butler characters. Snagglepuss was a mountain lion who had that Bert Lahr delivery, you know. And he'd say, exit, stage right. Or exit, stage left. Or does it make you nervous to look over your shoulder? Or make your shoulder to look over your nervous even, you know? Exit, stage left. I guess Snagglepuss is, is the guy that I get the biggest kick out of. Exit, stage right. Favorite character? I think it's Snagglepuss that Dawes does. I love Snagglepuss. Exit straight up! A program years ahead of its time arrived in the early 1960s. The day I entered the voiceover field, that was quite an occasion. That's where I first met Dawes Butler and a lot of other very talented people. But Dawes was my son, Elroy, and I was there to play Jane Jetson in The Jetsons, the first family in space. Elroy is fun because he's a perennial nine years old. Well, let me tell you, I can tell it better than you can. Well, don't be smart now. One of your best attributes, Elroy, is that you're not a smart aleck kid. You're a sweet little guy. You're a real guy, you know what I mean. But, but I mean, you don't give me that kind of an attitude. I, I don't like that in you. You know, I don't like it in you, you know, when you come on so strong just because, you know, you're the, you're the, you're the older guy and, and you think you know it all and maybe you think you do, you don't, but you, you, you know, you... Well, wait a minute, all right, come on now, uh, let's just get that little sweetness that we have on the Jetsons. Well, I think the thing he really likes is, you know, he's kind of old guy now and I'm only nine years old and I'm always going to be nine years old and nobody ever tells me what puberty means and... 
and I'll probably never know, but that's the way life goes, you know. But I'm just a kid, and to feel that you're a kid when you're, you know, like as old as he is, whoa, that's all. Hi, folks. Now that goes back to 1963, and we made 24 films. And Janet Waldo, and Jean Vanderpile, and Mel Blanc, and George O'Hanlon, and uh, Don Messick, who plays Astro the Talking Dog, and of course, Dawes Butler. Well, it was wonderful. Now, Roy, you've been splitting atoms again. Only a couple, Mom. See, I'm trying to invent some tablets that'll make you fly. Oh, that's ridiculous. Now clean up this mess before your father comes home. Okay, Mom. Gee, maybe I should cut down on the uranium mixture. <laughs> Nearly 25 years after his cancellation, The Jetsons was revived with the original voice actors doing the characters they had created. I think it's one of the few series shows of any kind that came back 20-some years later with the original cast. That's absolutely, which is fantastic. Every one of us, there's, there's not a replacement voice in there. Yeah. And they made us test for it before we did it. And <laughs> we still remember the voice, can we still do it? You know. Yeah. You know. Which, uh, I mean, it's like riding a bicycle. You don't forget. No. Because it isn't a voice, it's a character. In 1959, we all met up with Jay Ward, who was the producer of the Bullwinkle Show. The Rocky and Bullwinkle series featured Bill Scott as Bullwinkle, June Ferre as both Rocky the Flying Squirrel and Natasha, and Paul Fries as the dastardly Boris Badenov. And I had the pleasure of narrating the Rocky and Bullwinkle series, and I never talked so fast in my life. And I loved it. It was a lot of fun. That was one of the great experiences of my life because we did two shows, um, Fractured Fairy Tales and Aesop and Son. And in the Fractured Fairy Tales, uh, uh, Edward Everett Horton was the narrator. <laughs> Working with June Foray and the beloved Bill Scott, the three of us would, you know, each one maybe do four characters in each little four or five minute cartoon. Sleeping Beauty Land is a flop. Now, wait a minute. She's been asleep for 20 years, right? Right. Maybe people would pay money to talk to somebody who's been asleep for 20 years. You mean... Yes, we just wake her up. We'll make a fortune. Go ahead and do it. Who, me? You put her to sleep, didn't you? Well, frankly, no. I'm not really a wicked fairy. I'm just wicked. But then how? Easy. You kiss her. You're a prince, aren't you? Well, not exactly. I never joined the union. I really make my living beating pigskins. You mean? Yes. I'm a hog slogger. But just then a remarkable thing happened. Sleeping Beauty's eyes opened and she sat up. Don't worry, kids. I wasn't really asleep. Then why the big 20-year act? I just wanted to see if I could make it in showbiz. We did all the fractured fairy tales together. And I was always the princess. And, and he was always the, the prince. And we, we said to, we, we would record five in a night. And we maybe done two with the same voices. And we'd say to, to Jay, well, Jay, don't you want us to do, we just did, you know, a, a funny Brooklyn for a princess. And Dawes would do the same wacky little prince sort of out of his mind out of the atmosphere somewhere and Jay would say no we want you to do the same thing and so Jay was right and Jay was a stickler for doing it that was we'd read through it once he said okay let's put it down and we want to see you know even in reading it we couldn't look ahead and see what was coming up we'd have to luck out on maybe doing a character he would buy and uh, so those were a lot of fun and then later uh, Charlie Ruggles and I did a thing called Aesop Aesop's Fables, and Aesop and Son, 
And Charlie Ruggles was a great character. He, I can't do Edward Everett Horton, but uh, Charlie Ruggles had a little sort of a chuckle all the time. He says, that type, well, gee, Dad, don't you, don't wait, Junior. Now, Junior, Junior, this is the way it's going to be done. Now, you've got to listen, Junior. And that was his music. You see, it's all music. And once you get that in your head, it's like a dialect or a character. You never forget it. It's not the voice. It's the music that you remember. All set for today's lesson, Junior? Yeah, Pop. And here it comes, right over the old plate. A monarch cannot hope to please everyone. Got it? Oh, yeah, Pop. And that brings us to our story, which is, uh, how shall I put it? A gasser? The cat's meow. And it's all about, uh, oh, 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 trouble here. You brought the wrong scroll, Junior. This one is in Sanskrit. Can't read Sanskrit, boy. Got it's upside down, Pop. It, it is. Oh, of course. Good eye, son. Yeah. Now, today we hear all about the lion and the mouse. The lion, you know, is the king of the beasts. Besides the, the princes, he always played <laughs> strange, strange little characters. And Dawes has a way of, of breaking words up so that a one-syllable word can turn into three or four syllables. I don't know how he does it. I think he's the only one who can do anything like that. Dawes has warm and vivid memories of working with the late Bill Scott and Paul Freese. Paul was, was like nobody else. I mean, his, his speaking voice, he could sing, he did narration, he was a fast study. Uh, an impish sense of humor, a perfect sense of rhythm and timing, all those things I've talked about. I don't know if Paul ever thought about it. He may have just done it. I kind of broke it down, you see, but uh, from a teaching standpoint. And then he and, and uh, Bill Conrad would get going around in circles because Paul is as, as verbose or more than I am. With a million stories, you never get a session started, you know. And I'd have to remind him five or six times that I had another call after that to get out, you know. But. And he'd be going on and on and on. I just sit there because I have a great respect for the verbose, and, and uh, Paul was so good at it. I was willing to be an audience, you know. So one time, Bill Conrad, who was always pulling jokes about Paul, but with great affection, and he'd say, he'd say, Paul, he said, here you go on and on, like you're supposed to do some commercials. I've got a little time problem. I think Butler has. Here's quiet little Doss over there, doesn't open his mouth. Just here's you running and raving, and you go on like that. You'll never be the actor he is. You see, I mean, Paul would say, what did I do? What? I'm sorry, Bill. Oh, wow. Oh, what a mistake. You know, so that went on all the time. And one time, uh, Bill Conrad said, let me give you a picture of Paul, a little biography, mini biography. Paul was the kind of a guy you could meet at a party, and for the first 10 minutes, you think this is the most brilliant man you've ever met in your life. The next 30 seconds, you want to kill him. <laughs> See, Bill Scott, to me, was one of the most talented actors in town. Great sense of dialect, characterizations, uh, the top of his voice, the bottom of his voice, uh, inventive ideas. He wrote a lot of the uh, Fractured Fairy Tales and other things out there, too, in the Aesop's. Uh, he had a sense of humor which was unique and all his own, and he was an actor who was all his own. But he didn't go out into the field the way I had and do as many things as I did. Writing was basically his thing when he was at UPA. It was as a writer, you know, or a director. And uh, Warner Brothers, I think, prior to that. But I had a tremendous respect for him as an actor. And June, a wonderful actress. And uh, it was like we fed each other. We couldn't, we loved to work together. It was like a, like a romance. And to read a script for the first time, the cold readings should have been recorded, which we'd never seen and all the little inventive things the writers had given us. Beautiful material. But I'd just like to give uh, credit to him from the way I feel, because I always had a tremendous respect for him as a person, as a friend, and as a terrific actor, and comedian, and writer. So he had it all. And we miss him very much, and Paul. The J. Ward period was a joyful, creative experience for all concerned. Hokey smoke, yeah. Um, Dawes, Dawes wasn't in the Bullwinkle segments, so uh, Rocky and, uh, and the princes never got together. Nor did Natasha, darling. Um, or little Nell. Maybe he played his horse, I don't know. Because I loved horse, so I loved Dawes, too. 
Little Nell does love dolls. The culmination of all that Dawes has achieved in his career can be seen in his weekly acting workshop where actors hoping to polish their skills read scenes written by Dawes and listen to his comments and criticism. Maybe Huck and Yogi can be cajoled into telling us about it. Uh, you want us to tell about it? Yeah, if you guys want to. And, uh, well, he gets people to read, and uh, sometimes you'll have uh, two people read it. Then you'll say, okay, now you two guys read it. And uh, see if you learn anything from the first two guys who weren't all that great. Every week is different. Nothing is set down. I don't plot what we're going to do. I look at who I've got. Like I might have five girls and two guys. Then I'm in trouble. It's never always quite the same. I can't just lay out scripts and say, that's what we're going to do. But that's good because I get plenty of them. And they'll fit almost any contingency. Now I've written probably over 150 uh, relationship texts. And every, everything. Uh, parody, uh, horror, science fiction, comedy. Everything to make you... Forget yourself, get out of your own skin, and shed it, and get into the character as fast as possible. And to love the words, to respect the words, but don't let the words do it. Just let them be ideas that go into your head and come back as thoughts. And change of pace, high, fast against slow, dynamics, whatever, all those things. Well, all of this fits into what I do with the cartoons. I mean, that's just down to, you know, silly little funny voices and so on. But still, behind it is the acting concepts and precepts, you know. That was what was so great about radio and voiceover in that you established something in the, in the eyes, I mean, in the ears of the person listening because the eyes were out of it. So to do a voice like that, it'd be a very ineffectual little sort of a fop. And even doing things with final consonants and also articulating and because you must hear the words. And Joe Barbera is a great stickler for hearing the words. And in the early days, with Don Messick and I doing all those cartoons, Yogi Bear and, and that, I would hear the, the voice come from the, from the talk back in the booth with Joe saying, we've got to hear the words, you see. And he was a taskmaster. Masker? Master. You see, I would have had to watch the words if you were Joe. <laughs> it isn't just that you read lines and skip over things. He makes you pay attention, and each word is very important and uh, you have your pacing, your timing, and he's absolutely fantastic. Uh, years ago, there was a man in the theater, and he was noted for his directing. His name was David Belasco. And I watched him one day when I was a little girl. I was with my mother. She was an usher in the theater. And I watched him directing uh, a part of a play. And the closest thing that I have ever seen to Mr. David Belasco is Dawes Butler in what he can do with people. He can take you and he can give you all kinds of different characterizations and voices. Aunt Rapunzel will tell you a story, possibly one of the best known stories of all time. Uh -huh. Does this story start out uh, once upon a time? It does. That sounds familiar. Well, once upon a time... That's the part that sounds familiar. <laughs> well, uh, once upon a time there was a little girl... What's her name? But, but, but we had there, I, I, I know we had, and I seem to feel it because we were getting reaction, yeah. was that this was real. You weren't Penny, you were Aunt Rapunzel, yeah. and I wasn't Elroy, I was Donnie, and I really wanted to be told a story. And at first I was a little skeptical because Uncle Dunkle always tells me the stories. So. What has to come out of any of these things we do is truth. And the minute you can get out of your own skin and into the skin of the character you're doing, the better. I, th I think the wonderful thing about actors is that they need exposure. They need different things. Sometimes they don't get an opportunity to walk in and do a reading for something which has a little bone and marrow to it. So if I can accomplish that, that's, uh, that's what my dream is, really, uh, at this point in my career. And I enjoy this probably as much or more than anything I've ever done. Just as Dawes' workshop students love and respect his knowledge and guidance, so Dawes' colleagues throughout the years have a love of his special gifts, both personal and professional. I think if you used the Boy Scout oath, everything that's in that oath is Dawes. Well, he's one of the most loveliest persons I've ever met, and he, he's so 
He's so cooperative. You do anything you ask him to do. In fact, he always gives you more than you ask for. And, and he's so darn creative. He, he, he really makes the voice and helps make the character. And I can't say too much for him. And even my wife, Gracie, says, be sure and give my love to Dawes. My, I just love that guy. I don't know what we'd do without him. Dawes is that wonderful uh, combination of talent and respect and courtesy. All of those things rolled up into one. Uh, and I certainly owe him, if not my start in show business, the, the uh, opportunity to grab on to the next rung of the ladder and help myself up with a boost from him. And for that, I'm always grateful. He's concerned with people to a great degree in any facet of life. And he's got that kind of, a, of an inside feeling. It's sort of a love of humanity. Thank heavens we did have him in the formative years of Hanna-Barbera. If we hadn't have had Dawes, I don't know, there may not even have been a Hanna-Barbera. I mean, basically, when you break it all down, you asked me before, what is, the, what is the final thing? What do you think? And I think, basically, it isn't so much being happy, but being fulfilled. Like Noah Coward said, I won with the ability to entertain. And he, <laughs> he went a lot of heavy directions, but uh, that's what it breaks down to. And knowing neat people like Stan and Don Messick and Bill Scott and June, and it's, I've been very fortunate. Herb Vigran, all creamy people, as performers and as people. All in all, it's like uh, W.C. Fields said, all in all, I'd rather be in, in uh, what was it, Philadelphia? I'd just soon be wherever she is. Few entertainers have given us so much joy or made us smile so broadly as Dawes Butler. His enthusiasm, his sense of humor, and his dedication to his craft are unique traits in today's show business world. A thank you, Dawes, for the magic. Howdy, I am Quick Draw McGraw, the world's fastest gun, and don't you forget it. And I am Baba Louie, his sidekicks. Hey, this is Yogi Bear. Oh, my dear old father of the year, I want you to be my pal as well as my dad. Ah, uh, Trumper Snooper, the greatest, the world's greatest uh, detective, and one of this year's modesty and what? Wally Gator? Wally Gator, the silly alligator that loved the Dover loving Everglade. Uh, my name is Mr. Jenks, you know, and uh, I like to clobber those meese. I don't really hurt them too much, you know, I just kind of scare the wits out of them. Because <laughs> I hate meeses to pieces. Cecil, you see, she went with Belle Cecil is. You. And I'm only nine years old, and I'm always going to be nine years old, and nobody ever tells me what puberty means. Uh, yeah, well, um, that's what he does. Could I have a rim shot, please?